Now the stories uh, making the headlines in the media across the world. We start with Africa's Daily News. Looking at uh, the US president who said he will terminate the green card lottery program that helped uh, Seifulo Saipov, the suspect in the New York terror attack, come to the United States. There's also uh, an, an opinion piece in today's Guardian newspaper here in the UK which does criticise President Trump for his politicised reaction to the New York attack by targeting uh, Democrat Chuck Schumer for helping create the diversity uh, visa program. Um, let's have a look at some other stories. We'll quickly talk you through uh, some of the other ones. We've, we're struggling with our graphics, but the Financial Times, it looks at uh, Jay Powell, the expected nominee for the Fed, or Fed job, the chair of the Federal Reserve in the United States. And that will be in February of next year, if that is uh, in place. Also in the Financial Times, it talks about oil. The price of oil has been rallying above some $62 a barrel. And finally, the Atlantic, if we can get to that, is looking at uh, Facebook. Of course, our question on social media today, the ubiquitous company, is it actually, in effect, unable to control itself? It is now so large and permeate society right around the world. Well, let's welcome back Cornelia. I promised you she'd be back. She's been in the green room drinking very strong coffee, looking at all these stories for us. Nice to see you again. So let's start with the, the Africa Daily News. In Africa, this diversity visa program is incredibly important. Many people from across uh, Africa oh, yes. have entered into the US, have set up a, a life in the United States and become citizens through this program? Well, you know, in the world, not just in Africa, in the world, it's a diversity program. You can go on to it. Well, I can go on to it. Well, in the UK, you can't put your name in the hat. Okay, okay. But in some, some reasons, some countries, countries in the world, world yeah. but not the United States. But in most, most countries, you can. And the interesting thing here is, you know, America always stood for the, for the welcoming country. And the know? American dream. And a welcoming country and the American dream, and it was a happy place. And this was important. This was aspirational for so many people in Africa, in Asia, who, you know, could maybe not see a future for themselves in their own countries, and they could go to America. So this is a sad day. I mean, you know, putting this is into question... Is it a sad day, or is it, is it a necessary way of controlling immigration in a country that is facing uh, terrorism and facing that threat. I, I doubt it because it, you, can get, you can win the lottery and then you can still have to go through some vetting process. You know, one can still say, okay, we let you. And I it's a you. very stringent yeah. vetting process. Yeah, exactly. You can, I mean, it's a, so there is something to still, I, I think America wants to be seen as that ap aspirational place. Now, The Guardian is looking at uh, Trump's reaction to all of this. Of course, he's been tweeting pretty uh, avidly since oh. it happened. Also, we've heard what he's been saying at press conferences, but his most recent tweet talks about the fact that the uh, the attacker, the suspect, should face the death penalty. Yeah, well, I'm not an advocate of the death penalty, so I'm not going to even comment on this. But you know what but I've what the Guardian say? Well, the Guardian says two things. The Guardian says, look, contrast what he is, what he has, what he has done here. How how vociferously he's commenting on on this this attack, and then how with the um, Las Vegas shooting, which killed by four more people, he was Over he was very years. yes he was he was very presidential. And you know what? The two things I would sort of like to add to this: when Trump says that this is a, a joke um, and and a laughing. Stock, for the president to criticize his the own legislation of his country with such strong language is one thing. And as uh, Cuomo and Schumer said, you know, what he does is that these tweets were divisive. And is this really the right time to be so divisive? But then these are harsh times. I'm not the commander in chief. I can't criticize this, but mm. I find I've, I'm very concerned that the world at large is becoming so anti-Muslim and I personally I find that a very hard thing yep. to swallow. Let's look now at the big financial story of the day which will be assuming uh, Trump does not surprise us later today with his nomination the news that Jerome Powell will be the new boss of the Federal Reserve I mean you and I've already talked about this but interesting that uh, this article in the Financial Times talks about the fact that this is the continuity candidate and in this particular instance uh, President Trump will not be the disruptor 
because he could have been. There are other uh, candidates that have been discussed, like Kevin Walsh, who are, who are much less Janet Yellenish, if I can put yes, it that way. Yes, but then look at who is President Trump. President Trump comes from the real estate sector. He likes leverage. So he needs a dovish candidate, somebody who doesn't want to shrink the, the balance sheet to, of the Fed too quickly, who doesn't want to go up with interest rates too quickly. So I think it, it, from his point of view, it makes sense. As we said before, it's a, it's a, it's a billionaire. Um, he has that connectivity with the real sector through his work um, at Carlisle. The one thing he does not have is he doesn't have the PhD in economics, which could come in handy. Is that a must-have for this job, in your view? I'm an economist. I'm a PhD level economist, so yes, of course it is. <laughs> but All you know, right. when we come to the next crisis, that may be handy to to have you know studied you know several Send him economic some top crises. Tips. Send him some top tips. <laughs> Let's now look at OPEC. Now, I we I sort of requested this is in there for you, Cornelia, because you Thank worked you. at BP for a very long time. You hang out with all the top guys at OPEC, including other oil companies, etc. This article in the FT today talks about the fact that oil is now above $60 a barrel. It was $62 Brent crude yesterday, and they're sort of giving OPEC the credit for that. What's going to happen next, though? Will OPEC say we're going to keep these production cuts in place for longer than we originally said? Yeah, I think there's pretty much a consensus that they will keep them in place through 2018. And, you know, they need to keep them in place because a lot of the OPEC producers actually do need... Um, do need um, higher oil prices. And let's not forget Saudi Arabia wants to embark on this new policy, Vision 2030, of rejigging its economy. It needs, it needs some money from oil. It needs the money from um, Aramco privatization. And if you want to privatize an oil company, it's only 5% that they're privatizing, but a higher oil price probably does, does wonders. It does help, yes. I, I, yes, very, very good point. Let's look at the Atlantic now. Does Facebook even know how to control Facebook and that's the question that everybody's asking on the day that they come out with such robust earnings yeah. you're not a Facebooker are you Am I no right I'm not a face that? I don't do Facebook I do Twitter um, I do WhatsApp but I do not you do don't Facebook. do Facebook um, give us your take on this issue of of controlling it and it and it trying to police itself and and obviously in, in front of the Congress the lawyers are seeing quite tough questions. Well, well you know, I, yes, the lawyer had to, I felt sorry for him, but where I have an, an issue, where I have a problem, and, and I'm sure there's a solution for the problem, but I don't see how they can police themselves because there's no algorithm for, con for policing content. So yes, they want to hire 10,000 more people, but if they do that, that will eat into the profits. These are not going to be cheap people. They won't be, but also as well, they have to be seen to be doing something. But at the yeah. same time, the question is, are they just really a platform? And do we, as Facebook users, have to be savvy about what we're reading and make our own choices on whether it's uh, good, bad or ugly? Absolutely. Maybe one could do it like with, um, like with the tobacco, you know, at your own risk or something, a warning. Some... some Images, maybe. Well, let's just see what the viewers are t saying to us. We've got James Vickery in the West Midlands. That's here in the UK saying, I don't think it's fair for Facebook to police everything. Uh, reactive, uh, reactively to complaints, yes. Uh, but why shouldn't it be self-policing? So he feels regulation is not the answer. And then we've got Takudzwa uh, Kamwoto in Berlin. Thanks for your tweet as well. Facebook operates internationally. and How can it deal with different laws in different countries if point. they start to regulate it? But that's the issue with global companies. I mean, that's how it is, isn't it? It's if how it is. If you're working across the world, you have to be able to operate in every country and re respect the law of the land, don't you? Yes, but if I'm an oil company, I operate across the globe. I will respect all the various laws and I will, for environment, have the best standards ever. But... This is a platform. So, yes, you have to respect the laws of the country, but a platform with, with, with billions of users, that's, very, that's, that's, a, that's a different kettle of fish. That's so customer interfacing. Mm. It's interesting, and I'll talk about it another day. I know I will. Thank you, Cornelia, for being Thank in you. today. We'll see you again soon on The Briefing.